Hi, I'm Johns Hopkins with Baltimore Heritage, and welcome to the first of our five-part series that we're calling In the Shadows of Industry. And I'm here with our partners at the Baltimore Museum of Industry to explore five different historic industrial places on the waterfront um, that are also within easy walking distance of the museum. Um, I'm going to be joined by my colleague, uh, Curtis Durham. Um, this is going to be somewhat of a duet, so uh, stay with us for that. Um, uh, and we're going to hope that you enjoy learning a little bit about these places in these videos. And you can also explore more about them with our website and free app, um, explore.baltimoreheritage.org. And we'll put the website and the link for that up. Um, and finally, before we jump into our first site, the Procter & Gamble soap making uh, uh, facility, I have to say thank you to our sponsor, PNC Bank. Um, thank you all you folks at PNC for making this possible. All right, let's jump into the Procter & Gamble soap making uh, facility, one of the most prominent uh, and large industrial sites uh, on the Baltimore Harbor. Um, and uh, the buildings get started about 1929. That's when the first one goes up. But we're going to start our history uh, almost 100 years before, in 1837. And that's when a young English immigrant um, named William Proctor joins up with a young Irish immigrant named James uh, Gamble. Um, they found themselves in Cincinnati in 1837, uh, new immigrants, uh, pretty poor, and married to sisters. And one thing that they soon realized was that their new joint father-in-law was very encouraging. He saw them as young, bright business people, encouraged them to join up. Um, Proctor had been a grocer turned candle maker, and Gamble had been a soap maker. And one thing they had in common is both candles and soap needed lots of tallow and the animal products. And Cincinnati had a, a active slaughterhouse scene then. So they shared that interest to begin with. And pretty soon, uh, William and James became Procter and Gamble. And from the very first, they were uh, shrewd innovators and they were pretty thrifty. One of the first things they realized is in the byproduct of soap making, and they focused on soap making at first, um, there was an oil that if you refined it, you could sell as lamp oil. So they started selling soap and lamp oil. Further along, they realized another byproduct of the soap making process was a substance called sterum. And if you, if you uh, refine that, and you bet they learned how to refine that, um, you could use it as cooking oil. And I will bet that some of you in your cupboard have that, um, and it goes by the name of Crisco. So they, uh, Procter & Gamble was rolling away uh, making soap and making cooking products. Um, cooking products actually outpaced the soap sales. But by the early 1900s, uh, a new substance uh, gets invented. They invent a new thing called ivory soap, and that's a game changer. It's also helped by the fact that they are innovators in marketing. Um, not only do they develop new soap products, they develop new marketing uh, tools. And one of the things they did um, right off the bat was they did direct marketing to radio and then to television. And uh, by the mid middle of the century, they had uh, pioneered a new way, a new way of thinking about daytime television, and they helped develop um, these little shows that went from day to day. And they were so addictive that people would follow them from day to day, tuning in and also tuning into the advertisements that uh, sold Procter and Gamble uh, products. And those, of course, became known as soap operas. You, yes you, will love gentle ivory soap in this handy personal size, the toilet soap size. You know, you get four cakes of personal size ivory for the same price as three cakes of other leading toilet soaps. Like getting one cake free. And handy, look, fits perfectly in your soap dish and in your hand. Um, so we have soap operas, we've got uh, Crisco, and we've got soap, ivory soap. Um, and ivory is uh, uh, such a big hit that the Cincinnati firm needs to uh, build more plants, including the plant here in Baltimore. And we are an ideal location. We're on the water. Uh, we can get transatlantic ships, uh, especially from the Philippines, carrying tropical oils made in soap manufacturing. We're on the railroad, so lots of bars of ivory soap can get shipped out the door to all across America. We've got a uh, industrial base of small industries that are eager to buy the byproducts that Procter & Gamble is, uh, is um, uh, spinning off from their soap making. We've got a workforce that in 1929 and 1930 is eager during the Depression for jobs. And we have a large uh, slaughter industry as well, so lots of tallow 
flow and animal products go into it. So here we have the plant uh, beginning to be built in 1929 in Baltimore. And now I'm going to turn it over to Curtis uh, to talk a little bit about some of the things that the Baltimore Museum of Industry has um, related to this era in our industrial past. Curtis. Thank you, John, for that excellent introduction, and thank you again, PNC Bank, for the sponsorship. So as John said, uh, here we are in the Baltimore Museum of Industry. The gallery that we're in is our corner store. And um, as you can see behind me, these are the kinds of goods that you would have found um, at a turn-of-the-century corner store here in Baltimore, including some Procter & Gamble soaps. One of the soaps that we have in the collection is called uh, the White Naphtha Soap. So as John said, um, these soaps were made with different kinds of oils. The naphtha soap was specifically made with a kind of kerosene. Generally, soaps are a combination of um, fats and acids that are mixed in with a base, and that creates the substance itself. So as the, as the, as the technology and sort of the interest in, in handmade soaps progressed, um, you find things like added scents, or sometimes different scrubs. Um, this kind of soap was specifically used for household cleaning. Um, floors, clothes, um, just general household, uh, household cleaning, not specifically for hand soap. Um, we don't find that until later. Um, John's also mentioned the um, ivory soap that made Procter & Gamble um, famous, or at least pushed them further into the, into the uh, public consciousness. Um, the story behind ivory soap is a little bit interesting because it was created by uh, as a mistake. Um, one of the workers tending to the vat where all of the ingredients were turning and, and mixing together left for a lunch break and came back and uh, shut the machine off and the uh, soap got uh, hardened and sliced and packed and shipped off. And uh, a few months later, we have customers calling into P&G and saying, hey, what's this magnificent new stuff? It floats. So what happened was... Um, as the mixture continued to cook, more air bubbles were formed inside the soap itself, and it became more buoyant, and now we know how to make floating soap. Uh, a final um, interesting factoid about uh, P&G is that colloquially at the time, uh, sometimes their soap was known as the blind pig soap. P-G, lacking the I, blind pig. Back to you, John. Excellent. Thanks, Chris. Um, all right, we will transition from blind pig soap uh, into a more modern history. Um, of course, uh, anybody who's been in South Baltimore recently knows that Procter & Gamble's facility here did not last forever. It lasted until 1995 when a national restructuring, uh, in a national restructuring, Procter & Gamble closed the Baltimore shop. Um, obviously devastating for the workers and their families who were relying on that, had relied on it for generations. There was a little bit of hope. A Korean firm bought the uh, complex the next year in 1996, intending to make a specialty liquor that they were going to sell in the Far East. Um, there was an enormous set of crashes in Asian economies in the late 1900s that put the stop to that. And in 1999, the set of buildings was sold to a firm called Struver Brothers Eccles and Raps. And they had been pioneering the redevelopment of industrial sites here in Baltimore. If you know the American Can Company, they did that one. And actually up and down the East Coast with uh, tobacco warehouses in North Carolina and mill buildings in Rhode Island. And they took on this enormous project um, and uh, did it quite successfully. Turned it into a hip office space, really cool new industrial hip office spaces um, that lots of firms uh, were eager to get into. And then not too many years later, uh, our Under Armour uh, took over and calls its world headquarters. So today we are no longer bringing in tropical oils and sending out bars of soap, but we every day are bringing in loads, hundreds of 20-somethings who go there to work, and we are shipping out products. So let me make sure I get these right. Products uh, called Sonic 3 Metallic Running Shoes uh, and Hustle Fleece Hoodies. Um, all the orders for those coming through here. Uh, so once again, the Procter & Gamble facility on the waterfront is a hive of human activity. All right, I'm going to say thanks again to Curtis and all our partners at the Baltimore Museum of Industry and again to PNC Bank, um, and we hope to see you next time. Thanks so much.